Okay, let's uh, bring the meeting to order. Welcome back, everybody. This is a little bit earlier than we used to. Uh, we're used to starting our finance committee meetings, but uh, a special town meeting scheduled for January 28th will do that to us. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to do is introduce our two new members. Um, Deanne Russell is right here. Uh, she lives and will represent Precinct 4. And uh, <coughs> in a minute, I'll go, everybody can go around and introduce themselves. Uh, there'll be a test later. <laughs> okay, and representing Precinct 12 and living there is Daryl Harmer, right over here. I want to welcome you. Um, and why don't we just go around the table. Uh, Christine? Um, I'm Christine Dechler, and I represent Precinct 19. Dick Fanning, Precinct 15. Mary Margaret Frank Lamont, Precinct 5. Dan McKenna, Precinct 21. Dean Carter, Precinct 20. John Wall, Precinct 7. Alan Jones, 14. Brian Beck, Precinct 9. Rohit Dubari, Precinct 18. Thomas Kakabau, Precinct 11. <coughs> Pete Howard, Precinct 10. Charlie Foskett, Precinct 8. Okay, and now Tosti, we've been talking over the last couple of weeks. Um, so last night uh, at a meeting of the uh, uh, Finance Committee appointing authority, uh, Jean Ann and, and Daryl were appointed uh, along with the rest of you whose appointments came up at that particular time. So I uh, want to welcome you all and hope you have a chance to get to know each other as, as we go through the sessions uh, on that. Now, uh, I have my fancy dancy contact list uh, that I've uh, updated. But what I'd like to do now is pass this around. As we go through it, please check your address, phone number, emails, all that type of stuff. And if it's okay, just check it. And if it's not okay, please correct it. So, all right. Okay. Uh, Long-term planning. So you get to see this uh, about two months, well, a month and a half uh, ahead. So uh, with that, uh, our town manager, Adam Chaplain, is here. Adam. So they've, they've asked me to stand behind this microphone so they can capture me for the millions viewing at home. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, my name is Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So what I'm going to do is run through uh, the, the, uh, the current state of the town's long-range fiscal projection. It starts with the current fiscal year, FY16, in the, the far left side of the sheet, and projects year over year all the way through FY 2022 to the far right side of the sheet. Uh, the, the top third of the sheet contains revenue, and then sort of the middle part are appropriations or expenses, and then the bottom third outlines reserve balances, uh, and then uh, a few caveats, and then projected enrollment growth from the schools, which is an important uh, driver of some of the numbers that I'll talk about uh, within the, uh, the appropriations and actually the <coughs> revenue section of the plan. So uh, to start, uh, I'll go uh, line by line um, and feel free to ask questions as I go uh, if something I'm saying doesn't make sense. Uh, so starting with FY16, uh, we are just about to set the tax rate. So there's a few uh, times in the year where the actual uh, fiscal year can, uh, can shift a little bit. There's at town meeting, uh, a number is locked in as the FY16 budget. And then when the tax rate is set, we shift that to FY16 recap because there's a few numbers that can change. The actual amount of the tax levy is altered when the tax rate is set based on exactly what is raised. Uh, local receipts can be changed. Uh, and then the overlay reserve, which shows up in expenses, can be changed. So what I'm going to walk through here is soon to be submitted to the Department of Revenue for finalization as part of the tax recap process. So starting across the top line, you see state aid. Uh, those are the cumulative sums of money that we receive from the state, primarily in Chapter 70, which is education funding, and unrestricted general government aid, which is exactly what it's called. Uh, just uh, used, used to be called additional assistance, uh, but it's, it's funds the town can use at its discretion. What we project there across year over year is a 1% increase in the unrestricted general government aid. And then for Chapter 70, the education formula, we looked retrospectively and how Chapter 70 had increased as enrollment had increased over the past several years. And we found that Chapter 70 
uh, on average, it was increasing about $1,500 for every new student. So based on the enrollment projections that are carried on the bottom of the sheet, we project that Chapter 70 will go up by that amount per student. Uh, there's some other smaller local aid accounts, uh, <coughs> veterans benefits, charter school reimbursements, school lunch, library offset aid. Uh, we don't inflate those. We keep those flat as they're formula driven and aren't necessarily uh, funding decisions driven by the governor or the legislature. So you can see based on, based on the enrollment, there's some fluctuation in the percentage change across year to year, but again, that goes up and down as you can see the enrollment numbers go higher or lower. Below that is school construction aid. Those are the funds we receive from the, uh, what had been known as the SBAB, the School Building Assistance uh, Bureau. It's now the MSBA. Uh, that, that, that's the, both the prior organization and the current organization uh, is the state organization that assists cities and towns in constructing schools. So the former program, they would provide a city or town funds as the debt service related to a project is being paid. The current form is they give you the money as you're spending it. So you only actually borrow as a city or town uh, your share, and they pay their share in real time, reducing borrowing costs. But what we have here is related to projects that were performed under the old program. So you can see we have an amount we're receiving, a flat amount in FY16, 17, goes down in 18 as reimbursements for um, the Otteson School uh, roll-off, then goes down again in 19 and is level from FY19, 20, and 21. And then 21 is actually the last year that we receive any of those what I'll call old SBAB payments. Now, there's corresponding reductions in debt service that go along with this. So um, as those revenues go away, the expenses associated with them go away or, or are reduced uh, correspondingly. Moving down from that, we have local receipts. <coughs> local receipts is basically all uh, of the fees and other non-property tax revenues that the town collects. The main uh, number in local receipts is motor vehicle excise tax. It's almost half of the local receipts figure. The rest is licenses and permits, building inspections, uh, rental, uh, rental proceeds that we receive from the various t properties the town rents out, uh, hotel, uh, motel excise tax, meals tax, uh, and other associated fees that we collect. Uh, historically, in the past, we had been inflating that number as a projection at $50,000 a year. Uh, last year, we made the decision to bump that increment up to uh, a projected increase year over year of $75,000. And that's still fairly um, reasonable and conservative given uh, historical collections. Below that, we have free cash. Free cash or sort of the, uh, it's the undesignated or unreserved fund balance that the Department of Revenue certifies at the end of every year. The town's historical policy has been to use 50% of free cash as it's been, after it's been certified um, in the next fiscal year as an operating revenue. So in FY16, we used half of what's no longer represented on this sheet. Uh, if you go down to the bottom of the sheet, you can see the top line of the reserve balances carries a free cash number. The number in FY16 is what was just recently certified of $9 million. So if you carry up to FY17, you can see that we're taking 50% of that figure as an operating revenue. Going forward, what the Long Range Planning Committee decided to do last year was to take the 10-year retrospective average of certified free cash and use that as our projected free cash along the bottom. So you can see that, again, along the bottom in the reserve balances of what we're projecting for free cash. And then 50% of that is projected as a revenue year over year. So free cash, uh, I'll quickly touch on, is certified at $9 million this year. Our prior estimates had been that free cash would be certified somewhere in the six and a half to $7 million range. Uh, however, Last year, when the treasurer went out uh, to borrow funds in relation to the capital plan, uh, he received, or, or, or the deal he negotiated, had the town receiving bond premiums, which is actually cash that comes into the town. Uh, that had been being held in an account um, for future sort of deliberation by, by town meeting. However, this year, when the Department of Revenue and our new comptroller put their heads together <coughs> looking at those funds, uh, interpreted... Uh, basically the law on that differently than what the prior comptroller had and recommended rolling that into free cash. So that's why the number uh, for free cash is just about $2 million higher than what we expected it would be. Below that 
in terms of revenue is the overlay reserve. That's money that the Board of Assessors declares surplus that they no longer need to deal with abatements uh, filed by taxpayers. In FY16, they declared $350,000 surplus. In FY17 and beyond, we project that they'll declare at least $200,000 surplus, but on an annual basis, we ask them to go through outstanding abatements and overlay balances and determine what might be available. So we'll go through that exact process this year and update that as they provide more information as the budget process goes forward. Property tax, as you can obviously see, is the lion's share of the town's revenue. Uh, and FY16, that's the number that will actually appear in, what, uh, appear in what is raised as part of the tax rate in the recap process. And what's included in there is the base levy, debt exclusions pertaining to uh, form, uh, our, uh, past school projects, we budget $450,000 in new growth. And also included in the levy is $5,593,112 in what's called an MWRA debt shift, where money related to MWRA debt service, which could be put on to the water sewer bill, is actually raised as part of the tax rate. That was a decision the town made probably more than a decade ago uh, <clears throat> to, to provide some relief to rate payers in the water sewer. Uh, enterprise fund. So those are sort of the key parts um, in the actual tax levy. On a year-over-year -year basis, what you see is a 2.5% increase as allowable, that $450,000 new growth that I mentioned, uh, as well as those, those other components. In FY16, uh, though we budgeted $450,000 for new growth, actual new growth uh, was just over $1.3 million. Uh, a great deal of that was uh, from uh, tear down, rebuilds, and condoizations of properties in town, as well as growth in personal property uh, in town. So we've also looked at a retrospective 10-year average for new growth. If we look at that and you back out new growth that was attributable to both the Sims project uh, as well as the Brigham's project, because those are projects of scale that we, we won't see on a recurring basis given our density and how built out we are, uh, our 10-year average uh, for new growth is about $730,000. So we continue at the long range planning level to have discussions about whether or not we should be adjusting that new growth figure up um, to, uh, to, to more closely resemble what the 10 year average has been. So the next line is reserved for uh, utilizing the override stabilization fund as a revenue. You can see in FY16 and 17, that is not projected uh, to be necessary. However, starting in FY18, uh, and beyond, you start to see um, projected uh, drawdowns or withdrawals from the override stabilization fund. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll pause there if anybody, if it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, any questions on revenues? Peter? Is the CPA revenue in here somewhere? So yeah, the, the, uh, the CPA revenue is actually raised, um, uh, no, no, I, I, I'm sorry. It, it is a surcharge that is not demonstrated as part uh, of the property tax being raised. We try to focus this analysis on the general fund and balancing the general fund. So we, we, we could add it in and we would put a balancing offset for our expenditures in the, uh, the bottom. I see you have an explanation at the bottom. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? <coughs> have Jonathan? Yeah, Adam, uh, on the free cash reserve balances, you're, the decision is to project at 50% of no, you know, it, it's, um, it's funny that it appears as though that is what it is, but that's actually the 10-year retrospective average of certified free cash. Okay. It, it, I, it, it's, it's funny that it's close to half, but that's not actually what the math is. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Right, <laughs> <laughs> it's Peter? Uh, could, Adam, could you say again what the... Uh, uh, the bond-related income is? So when, when the treasurer goes out to borrow uh, and working with our bond, our bond counsel and financial advisor, there's the ability to basically, uh, for, for paying a higher rate, receive a bond premium. That bond premium comes in as revenue to the town. That revenue, um, by the current interpretation of the DOR, is supposed to come into the town and then be released back into the general fund, sort of as a, as a reimbursement to the general fund. So 
Those were received when the treasurer went out to borrow last year. They were sat in an account at the end of FY15. We've now closed them out to go into the, to the general fund, thereby increasing our free cash balance. The reason you get it is that interest rates are so low these days. When the underwriters are bidding for the town's bonds, they don't want to bid, so the coupon is really low, like down around one, two, or three percent, because five years from now, they'll have difficulty selling those. They'd rather put the coupon, in other words, the actual interest rate on the bond, up around four, five, or even six percent, and then give you a whole bunch of money that brings the effective interest rate for the whole bond issue down. So the reason we're getting these, everybody's getting these big premiums now is because the interest rates are so low. Once the interest rates start to return to sort of a more normal level, then the premiums are usually uh, much, much lower. Tiebreakers, practically. Thank you. All right. OK, Good. any other questions on the, on the revenue side? OK. <coughs> All right. Appropriations, the fun, fun side. <coughs> so uh, we start with the school department budget. Uh, so back uh, starting in uh, FY12, the first year of uh, the override that was approved in FY11, uh, the, the general agreement and structure was that general education costs would be allowed to grow by 3.5% a year. Special education costs would be allowed to grow by 7% a year. And then uh, town expenses would be allowed, uh, or town operating expenses would be allowed to grow by 3.5% a year. Since 2012, since FY 2012, a number of things have happened. First, so you'll, you'll see general education costs, special education costs. Below that, you'll see kindergarten fee offset. So back, uh, I believe it was actually in, we had a special town meeting in 2000, in was that 2012? I think it was 2000, 2012, effective to, uh, fiscal year 2013, I believe. Uh, the school department had performed an analysis and learned that by the elimination of the kindergarten fee that was being charged by the school department, we would receive uh, an equal, if not greater, amount back in Chapter 78 from the state. So as part of that, we had to fund what they expected to collect in fees and then they would get the revenue back from Chapter 70, and that, and that is exactly what happened. But in their projections for kindergarten fees, they never projected to increase kindergarten fees. So we've carried that as a flat sort of base number every year in their budget. Moving on from that, two years ago, uh, again, the town acknowledged that with really what had been unexpected enrollment growth in the district, that there needed to be some adjustments to the operating budgets for, uh, to, 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 to recognize the, the growing enrollment in the schools. So what was agreed upon was that the enrollment as of October 1st, say this year, uh, whatever the increase was, we would use that number multiplied by 25% of the per pupil costs as approved by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education at the state level, and that would be what we'd call the growth factor. So to see the mechanics of it, if you look at, uh, if you look at FY17, you see growth factor is $274,785. That's actually, if you go down to the bottom of the sheet, that's the projected annual growth in students at 84, multiplied by the uh, actual, uh, what am I looking at here, 25% of the actual FY, uh, FY14 DESE per pupil costs <coughs> which is the total per pupil is $13,085. This is right at the bottom of the sheet. So the amount we multiplied by is $3,271.25. So that's how the growth factor has been calculated and is calculated going forward. Every year as DESC updates per pupil expenditures, we update the calculation. So what we do mathematically in terms of how this formula works so in FY16, you can see the growth factor was $530,000. So in FY17, that goes into the base of the general education budget, and it, that number is then inflated by the percentage increase. And then there's a new growth factor, and then every year going forward, that same, that same uh, process happens. <coughs> so going further, last year, again, the Long Range Planning Committee was looking at ways of further extending the life of this financial plan 
um, or ex extending how long we would not need to look at considering an operating override. So last year, we decided that for FY16, town budgets would only grow at three and a quarter percent as opposed to three and a half percent. School budgets would stay at three and a half percent and SPED would stay at seven percent. But for FY17, school growth would go down to three and a quarter percent for general education and stay at seven for special ed and town growth would go down to three percent. And then for 18 and beyond, general ed would be at three percent and the town would be at three percent for growth. And that's what's represented here in this plan. So any, any questions on that? Dan? So I guess it's more of a, a, a comment and just more of a thought for the presentation on long-term planning is um, I don't know why on the growth factor line we roll it in to the next year base instead of just making it a, a cumulative line. And the reason I bring this up is, um, and, and you were there a couple times, where you know the reality of what goes on in the school budget is we've got the, all these buckets. We've got the three and a quarter for general ed, the 7% for special ed. We've got the growth factor. And then we've got the indirect lines, right? Health insurance goes up 6% a year, 7%. That doesn't go to the school budget. It goes to health insurance line. Pension costs go to the pension line. CapEx goes to the CapEx line. And I can't tell you how many meetings I've sat in or I've heard that the town cuts the school budget. And I've heard that the town's done nothing, nothing to address this growth factor with money. And I sit here and I pull out the old spreadsheets and I think, well, we've put in two, like about two million bucks for new growth. But when you look at this sheet, the sheet leads you to believe that we haven't. Because after the initial year, it rolls it up top. So it gives people this false sense, you know, that, you know, whoever the town is, right, I don't care if they're, I don't have to blame you, us, the selectmen, whatever, but it gives this false sense that no money has gone to this growth problem. And, and you were there when I think someone actually went to the extreme of saying that with all this growth, I can't believe we cut the, the school budget. <coughs> so I, I don't understand how, like a, what is it projected? Like a, I don't understand how a five, five and a half percent annual growth in your budget is a cut. And that's where I guess, from a presentation perspective, I think it's it's frustrating, right? And then I think there's a there's another issue. I think when you get, you know, the McKibben report has the school enrollment numbers going up and up and up to let's say 2020, <coughs> and then it turns and it starts to go down and down and down and down, right? So I think when we get to 2020, with all these numbers that have been rolled into the base, if you have, if there comes a point like sometimes you where money has to come out of the growth factor, because it goes both ways, right? If you're declining enrollment, the agreement is it's gonna go down. Well, all that money that's gone in, which probably is at that point four or five million additional incremental dollars, will now be viewed as never having gone <coughs> in. And the big bad finance committee is cutting, you know, th this budget. And so I guess my, my one comment on the long range planning side is, the, separate, the ruling in of it, I think, starts to lead to a false narrative that doesn't exist. And it, you know, that's just my two cents on it. So I, I, I get that, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I actually fully agree with what you're saying. The presentation, the, the, the reason we roll it in is because I don't think there's a good argument to not inflate the growth factor in the following year by the percentage increase. Agreed. So we, I, I could, see if a set, like adding a new line accomplishes what you're talking about. So sort of a cumulative growth factor that's inflated at the 3% growth, and then a new growth factor. So it shows both an accumulation and a new allocation every year. That, yeah, or just something down at the bottom that just says cumulative dollar. Yeah, that, growth. that's another way to do it as a, as and a even yeah, the inflation. That way I can, I feel like, you know, I feel like I don't have to go pull out old binders and start figuring out what the total number is to, you yeah. know, no, ward that off. It gets lost in the $40 million appropriation, yeah. I agree. Thank you. Okay, Paul. Uh, this FY 2016 number is the bottom of projected annual growth of 169. So is that that's actual growth? Uh, yeah. I'm, yes, that's actual growth. Um, and 84 is actually uh, actual growth too. As that, as I have here, the sheet from February 4th of 2015, and that's exactly the number that was on the, sh the projected on the sheet. So. I, I, I'll, I'll chalk that up to my forever desperate attempts to get this all to fit on one page and not, not utilize extra <laughs> lines, but that, that's the fair point. 
good, okay. to, good to move on. All right, so uh, moving down from uh, the schools, uh, immediately following the net school budget, you see Minuteman, uh, also school related. Our assessment for Minuteman, based on just about 150 students attending Minuteman, was uh, just over $4 million. In FY17, uh, they have sent us preliminary numbers, so we've plugged the preliminary numbers in. Uh, based on 120 students being our enrollment for FY17, you can see uh, the Minuteman projected uh, appropriation uh, for FY17 actually goes down by uh, almost half a million dollars. Uh, historically, what we've done is inflate that figure by 3.5% a year. I, I, if you look historically, it's gone up and down by amounts far outside of that 3.5% figure, but it's strictly enrollment driven. Uh, and it's hard to pinpoint what the enrollment to the vocational school will be. Uh, so for budget planning purposes, we've for some time just used that percentage growth uh, number to, for a planning, uh, really a planning plot. Moving down from there, you can see the town budget. We have it first broken out by personnel uh, costs and then expenses. We then have a, a line below that, which are costs that are attributable to the enterprise funds that are provided by general fund uh, or town operating departments, but really are geared towards the enterprise fund. So we see enterprise fund offsets. That results in a net town budget. And you can see across the line, the net town budget uh, is capped at 3% a year. Immediately below that is the $5.5 million MWRA debt shift that I referenced under the revenue section of the plan. This is where it is actually carried as an expense uh, as an offset to us <coughs> raising that money and then transferred to the enterprise fund. Below that, we have the capital budget, which is broken down into exempt debt service, uh, money that was, uh, or debt service that was approved as part of a debt exclusion, non-exempt debt service, that's debt service that's supported by the tax levy uh, or within the, uh, underneath the confines of the Prop 2.5 tax levy, direct cash capital appropriations, uh, and then offsets and carry forwards uh, both from prior year capital carry forward and offsets from off general fund accounts uh, that can support capital expenditures like our antenna fund, uh, which can go towards recreation, uh, and our ambulance fund, which can go towards uh, ambulance and, and other related expenses. So what we see is a total capital number. Now, the capital number is not formulaically increased year over year. It's actually governed by needing to be within 5% of operating revenues, and that's what governs capital. So what we have here for capital is what was contained in the Capital Planning Committee report the town meeting last year with an addition of FY 2022, uh, taking from the actual debt service sheets, but having that not been updated by capital planning yet. In the upcoming weeks, there may be some updates to capital in dealing with the impact of those bond premiums on the actual cost of debt service. So I didn't provide any of those numbers here tonight. And, uh, we, we have a lot. I want to get through the uh, special town meeting. So why don't you too much. take the take the, the rest of them, just do a brief summary, and, uh, and then we can move on. No pressure. Uh, so uh, that, that, there's more to come in the capital budget. Below that, we have pensions. Uh, that had been 6% as part of the original plan through the good work of uh, Mr. Foskett uh, working with the retirement board last year. We agreed to drop that percentage increase year over year to 5.5%. Insurance, that line item contains predominantly employees' health insurance, uh, but also unemployment insurance and liability insurance and workers' compensation uh, insurance. What we do there is we increase the number by 5.25%, which is what uh, the GIC, the state's insurance plan, has increased historically over the past seven years. Um, and we are members of the GIC and we inflate at that percentage, but we also do a calculation of how many new teachers we think will be hired as a result of new students coming into the district, and we put on um, an estimated an amount of new plans. So that's why you see uh, varying percentage increase numbers year to year for insurance. Below that is state assessments. That uh, is what comes to us from the state. They give us money at the top and then they take some back uh, as part of expenses. It's $3.1 million. We inflated it 2.5% a year. Uh, almost the entirety of that is our MBTA assessment. About 2.8 million of that 3.1 goes to the MBTA. 
<coughs> Below that is offset aid. That's also money we receive from the state but then directly have to expend for a particular cause. In this case, it's library aid, so we offset it here and you can see where we carry it. Below that is the overlay reserve. That's money that's put aside for the Board of Assessors to handle tax abatements as filed by taxpayers. Uh, you can see this year as part of the tax recap process, we've pretty substantially increased that number. Uh, the planning protocol is that we <coughs> funded, as you can see, starting in 17, 6, 6, and then in a revaluation re year, we bump it up to 8, 6, 6, 8, and so on and so forth. Below that, we have fixed costs, reserve fund, and elections. Last year, the reserve fund was funded at $1.2 million. The balance was for elections, uh, not the number four, but going towards elections. Uh, from here on out, you can see we have projected $1 million for the reserve fund, and then based on the number of elections projected to occur in each year based on state election years and non-state election years, the number uh, attributable to elections goes, ups and, uh, goes up and down. Below that, a line called Other Court Judgments Deficit Sims. Uh, the two big numbers in there are the exact amount of debt service that is attributable to the town's prior purchase of the Sims property. So we raise, we receive tax revenue from that property, but then we have to set aside what we owe in the debt service. So that exact amount, which is just about $670,000, gets raised there. There's also $500,000 in that line set aside for snow and ice deficits. And then there's a, a hundred thousand dollars set aside for potential court judgments that happen after the budget process and need to be raised on the tax rate each year. Below that, warrant articles. Those are miscellaneous warrant articles that are approved by town meeting. The lion's share of that number is what the town puts towards its OPEB uh, or retiree health care liability. And then the final line is the override stabilization fund. <clears throat> you can see in FY 16 and 17, we still project to be making um, deposits into the override stabilization fund, uh, but then going back up to the top, you can see that in FY18, we begin to withdraw. So if you follow along the bottom, the third line in reserve balances is the override stabilization fund. You can see it reach its peak in FY17, and then as the drawdown begins, you can see the balance start to diminish, leading up to FY2021, where we would, we would project it fall short of fully balancing the projected <coughs> budget in that year by uh, just about $400,000. Carrying that forward with the accumulated deficit over the years, um, a projected deficit of just over $11 million in FY 2022. Okay, are there any questions for the manager? I'm sure you'll all absorb this. <laughs> okay, Charlie. So, <coughs> in fiscal year 21, yes. The uh, contribution from the override stabilization fund is nine million eighty-five thousand, right? In the revenue, you know what? Yes, it is. that actually would be balanced there. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand. Yeah, because yeah, you have an additional one point four million. Yeah, I didn't carry that over, right? No. Yeah, so that would wipe that out, and it would reduce the next year to about. I think it's ten million. Yeah, ten million. Yeah. Thank you. It's all right, glad to help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what I'd like to do now is go through the warrant and uh, uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how long this takes at town meeting. I think a lot of it will just depend on the recommendations that are made. Uh, what I'd like to do first is do Article 6, 7, and 8. Uh, those deal with Minuteman. Now, uh, there's been people that have been working very hard on this issue uh, over the last uh, six months, and uh, none harder than uh, Selectman Dunn. So, Dan, if you'd like to come up here and use the microphone, there's three articles here. Uh, if you could briefly go through each uh, and sort of explain what's happening. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Happy to be here. Happy to see everyone. Familiar faces, mm -hmm. old and new. Uh, or, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I can only claim that I was up at 6 a.m., whereas Charlie was up in what time zone? <laughs> exactly. And so uh, there has been a lot of progress on this in the last uh, two months, but uh, I definitely would also say that it's only because of the pro the work that happened before. So. Al's work on the task force in starting in 2010 
and then Charlie's work on the task force in 2012. Those both got us to a draft in 2014, and what I'm working with is the draft that they created. So I'm standing here in some way, you know, the only reason that we're like trying to close the last few inches is because they moved um, everybody so much closer to begin with. Uh, so first up is, uh, was the Wayland one, is that correct? On the, uh, uh, is that the first or the third? It's the, the middle one. Uh, all right, so let me, I'm not gonna necessarily gonna tackle these in order. Uh, first up, uh, Wayland wants out. Wayland voted under the old regional agreement to leave. The, and the, under the old regional agreement, that goes to the school committee, the, the Minuteman School Committee, who is obligated to pass it along. They have passed it along, and it requires unanimous consent for Wayland to leave under the old regional agreement. Lexington has already said that they can't. So our vote is effectively moot, but at the same time, uh, the school committee has explicitly asked us to take to make sure that we keep the vote and I think we should take that opportunity and take the vote and I believe and I re strongly recommend that we also deny their uh, being able to leave because uh, it is part of our strategy to get an overall new regional agreement is that if we let people out one by one they don't have a lot of incentive to stick with us and get what we really need over the finish line which is this new regional agreement so uh, if anybody, I guess I probably want to take any questions on that one if it's appropriate first. Because I, I think this one's kind of a slam dunk. We should just say no. We should say it kindly. We should say, with all due respect, we want to let you out, but we're going to let you out in the way that's appropriate, not in this particular way. Okay, so th this is basically uh, a fairly straight vote. Um, if we say no on, uh, as recommended by Mr. Dunn, I'll ask you to write the comment. I'll be happy to do so. Okay. <laughs> Any questions on it? Okay. All right, next, next up. Let's talk about the regional agreement. So things on this have been moving very quickly. Uh, and the terms of, uh, have been, uh, so I would say, so, Can we, yep. Dan, I think it would be helpful since, since this really started Moving back in 2010, I think a third of the people sitting here <laughs> weren't in the room we used to sit here. All right. Okay. So, uh, Arlington is not pleased with the current regional agreement because the regional agreement uh, gives us only one vote out of 16, despite the fact that we send a third of the students. And that has led to some governance problems, which have led uh, before in my time, but under Alice Chairman, and Alice told me the stories about when this committee chose to fight the Minuteman school budget and had to go on tours of all the other town meetings to try to get them to fight it. And since it's two, so it's uh, the budget requires a unanimous, uh, sorry, a majority vote on the school committee, which means you could have you know 10 or 15 percent of the students generating a majority on that board. Then it takes two thirds of the towns, which means 11 towns have to say yes. And so for us to persuade Minuteman to do something we wanted, we had to either win at the school committee level or win at the town meeting level. And given that and that was very, very difficult and we didn't often get what we want. This was later in the uh, mid 2000s, Paul Schlickman was on the board <coughs> and Arlington had uh, contested the way that the assessments were being calculated and uh, Minuteman didn't want to li listen to us and we ended up simply not paying them for a while and then in the end we won and we got, but this was all part of the governance and us not having the vote that we should. Did I fairly characterize that? Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so we have, uh, so as a finance committee and as board of selectmen and as a town meeting, we have taken repeated votes that say any capital expenditure will be fought by Arlington. Arlington will not agree to any capital expenditure until we have a new regional agreement. And the reason we can do that is because capital expenditures under the old, re or the current slash old regional agreement require unanimous consent. So it is the place in all of this where we have had leverage, where we never used to have leverage before. So we've been saying, so a, a, a more recent history is uh, Minuteman came uh, with a capital expense to uh, do the plans for this new school that they're looking for. And uh, we and Belmont um, gave Minuteman a very hard time and finally negotiated a set of um, conditions by which we would uh, pay the capital for those plans. And one of the things that we said that they have to do is really, really work on this regional agreement because we're not going to get a vote. To, uh, not, we're not going to get a positive capital vote from Arlington until we have the new regional agreement. Uh, 
And so Al worked on a group in 2010 and 11. Charlie worked on a group on 2012 and 2013. In 2014, the Minuteman School Committee put forward a draft regional agreement, which the Finance Committee recommended, the Selectman recommended, and town meeting approved. 10 of the 16 towns approved that reg draft regional agreement. Wayland voted no, and five towns chose not to act. Uh, the reasons for those no's and inactions are varied, uh, but I would say that one of the things you can definitely say is that Minuteman Occupy gets a lot of mind share in Arlington because it's so much money for us and it's such a big deal for us and it really is a part of our community. Whereas for a lot of these other towns that send one, two, five students, it's 20,000, 30,000. It's one of those bit, it's one of those items on the Warren article that everybody just says yes and, and nothing actually happens. And so we were ready to talk about the regional agreement before a lot of other people were. And I think that that's part of why these uh, six towns didn't uh, get to yes uh, previously. Uh, so then, in, so that was 2014, 10, Five one in 2000, that was 2014. 2015, there was a renewed attempt to get those six towns over the finish line. Didn't really go anywhere. None of the towns actually, um, none of the towns changed their vote. Wayland said no again, I'm pretty sure. And uh, the other five towns again passed. This summer, the Minuteman School Committee said, you know, we've tried this twice. We're not trying it again. We're giving up on this regional agreement. We're just going forward with the building which of course were fairly depressing, I think, for people here in Arlington because uh, without a regional agreement, we have to fight the school and there's gonna be no progress and it's just gonna uh, be ugly. Uh, what happened, and I'm not gonna get the exact timeline of this right, but um, some in uh, Boxborough, who's one of the towns that didn't vote, uh, one of their selectmen is a guy named Vince Anamoroso, Al Tosti's cousin, um, <laughs> 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 And Vince uh, was very frustrated with all of this himself, and he managed to get himself appointed to the Minuteman School Committee, which I think really gave him a lot of education about what the actual problems were, and it gave him renewed insight into why the regional agreement was important. And so he asked the school committee for effectively a little bit more time to work on a new regional agreement, and he put forward something that um, <coughs> I'm gonna call the Boxborough Protocol. And on October 30th, 16 selectmen from 16 towns, I think it was like 14 and a town administrator and one missing or something like that. On October 30th, we met in Weston. Then we met again on December 2nd, and then we're meeting again tomorrow. And those 16, that group of 16, uh, so on October 30th in particular, after that meeting, we put together a group of the, I called it the six plus one. It's the six towns that said, didn't say yes, plus one, which is Arlington on the other side. And we worked with each one of them trying to say, okay, what is it that's gonna get you to yes? And for a number of them, in particular Boxborough and Wayland, they did not feel that the previous agreement gave, gave them adequate assurance that they were going to be able to leave. Uh, so this thing called the Boxborough Protocol is that uh, during this month of December, any town that is considering leaving Minuteman takes a vote at the Board of Selectmen level and saying, we are considering leaving Minuteman. They communicate that information to Minuteman, and then Minuteman is putting forward this regional agreement that I'm talking about here, which I'm kind of like, there's a little bit of chicken and egg in this conversation. Uh, and as a part of that vote, we are being asked to explicitly let anybody who is considering leaving to leave. So for instance, Wayland is the most clear-cut example because they've taken three votes to leave and they're taking another one. Wayland has raised its hand and said, we wish to be considered to leave Minuteman. And so they're going to call a special town meeting to approve this regional agreement and they're going to take at least two and probably three votes. The first vote is to leave Minuteman officially, again. I mean, that's a repetitive vote for them, but this time it's under the, this, uh, they will adopt the regional agreement <coughs> And they'll probably also have to vote on uh, the debt related to the, to the new school, depending upon, but I'm, I'm gonna get to that one in a minute. Uh, whereas Arlington, the our, <coughs> as a board, we, on um, a week ago Monday, 10 days ago, we voted very explicitly that we were not considering leaving 
uh, Minuteman. And that, th that's actually kind of important because if Arlington chose to try to leave to Minuteman, the whole deal falls apart because no one knows what anything is going to happen. So uh, Minute uh, Arlington will not be listed on those potential towns that are, that are talking about leaving. So uh, back to the so these so that's the Boxborough Protocol, um, and so this group kept uh, so these select so these selectmen and these subgroups in a series of meetings have been churning through different ways to get these six towns that didn't <coughs> say yes to yes, and that is the phrase I keep using over and over, trying to get people to yes um, without losing anybody else. And uh, one of the terms that you may have read about in the paper most recently um, that I think we would have lost some people is um, Lincoln is definitely the dip most, at this point, the, mo I guess the most difficult town to get to yes. And uh, as part of simply getting to the, them to yes is they feel like they need to be compensated for being <coughs> post community because the new building will be in their town. And so part of it was including a payment to Lincoln within the regional agreement. And there are a number of towns, notably Concord and Lexington, who are not comfortable with that. So what I'm about to talk to you about is doesn't include that. So I think that's been like a lot of history lesson. And now I'm just going to talk about the actual meat of what's actually going to be, I believe, before you. I, I guess I'll give you a little bit more history. Uh, so last night, the <coughs> Minuteman School Committee met, and they considered this draft regional agreement. Uh, did you forward all those documents out? Do they have those? Drafts or no? If not, we can we can we can forward them along. Uh, I don't remember if I did or not. Okay. So, so Minuteman looked at the school committee looked at a bunch, and then they chose last. But since the selectmen are meeting tomorrow, and by the selectmen I mean the 16 towns selectmen, uh, they chose to defer until after that meeting to see. They the ostensible reason is they don't want to tie the hands of those 16 selectmen. And so my goal is to go into this meeting tomorrow and get 16 towns to say, yes, this is a plan that we can all support. Minuteman will then meet again on Monday. They've already called a special Minuteman school committee meeting. And on Monday, they will approve this regional agreement and put it forward to the towns, which will be what is on our uh, warrant on January 25th. So as I, the current draft looks like this. Uh, the 2014 draft agreement is the base document, and just as a quick refresher, that things does things like it gives uh, an aspect of weighted voting on the sc uh, school committee level. So we will our vote is partially one sixteenth and partially uh, by the number of students. It changes the way the capital is allocated. It changes the way uh, like capital assessments are made. It changes the way the regular assessments are made. Um, it dramatic. It changes the exit provisions of how individual towns can leave, and it also gives um, towns that don't want to pay for debt. Uh, ways to do so by attempting to leave the district. Excuse me. So that's a, like the, the absolute possible, shortest possible summary of the 2014 draft. Uh, there's a lot more in that. So base document, so we're talking about voting on. The, base, the 2014 is a base. The exit provisions for towns that desire to leave, that's the Boxborough protocol that I just uh, described to you. Um, it includes a phrase that any town that withdraws is explicitly exempted from any debt that's occurred after December 10th, 2015, which is to say the Waylands and others of the world who wish to leave the town, or leave the regional agreement are not responsible for the debt if we choose to build a new school. Um, this one is not going to be popular at this table. It is the elimination of the five pupil minimum in the capital assessment formula and re reduces it to one uh, person in the capital assessment formula. Uh, Arlington has been and continues to be an advocate for that particular piece because it will help to, to discourage some of the smaller towns from, it, it makes them, I shouldn't say discourage, it, it requires them to pay for a, a seat at the table. Um, I, 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 I was willing to go along with this change grudgingly because I believe that it will help get Lincoln over the finish line in particular. I think it will also um, help uh, Weston and Dover, which frankly is less of a concern for me, but it is true that that will be an effect of it. Uh, the capital assessment still includes that every town must pay a 1% like minimum, which when we're sending 400 students from the district is approximately a four student minimum. But it is, there is no mistaking that this is a concession on the amount of money that Arlington would benefit from 
under uh, this new, region, new regional agreement. Uh, it, so new ter the next term, it includes a declaration that non-member communities shall pay assessments including capital fee equivalent to the average per pupil assessment as a member. So one of the things that has been frustrating to us in Arlington and most and even more to people in Belmont is that uh, out of district students end up paying less than in district students mostly because partly because of state legislature and partly because of DESE and partly because of policy. Uh, DESE has said that they're putting forward a new regulation that says that any um, out of district student or sorry Minuteman can negotiate with sending towns and those sending town uh, and, and negotiate a capital fee. So for instance, um, one example would be Waltham. Waltham sends a large number of students to Minuteman. Should Minuteman build a new school and incur a bunch of capital, Minuteman will be free to negotiate with Waltham and say, hey Waltham, you can send your students, here's the tuition rate and here's the capital rate. And that will help us defray, hopefully, <coughs> the cost of um, paying for this, for the, because that, the, the, the mismatch in the size of the, of the school. But this particular phrase says that the Minuteman School Committee must enforce the capital provisions up to the limits of the <coughs> law unless there is a two-thirds vote of the school committee to back off. So this was driven very strongly by Belmont because Belmont is concerned that the Minuteman School Committee is essentially going to cave to these out-of-district uh, towns. And this gives Belmont a really strong opportunity to block that because it's a two-thirds of the weighted vote. Belmont is a very high uh, sending town. And so Belmont, like Belmont plus Arlington effective would, would be one that could block this. It, it's not perfect because it's within the limits of state law and state law itself is too permissive. But in my mind, that's the best language we could get without a legislative remedy. Um, it also rec removes the requirement that the host community be a member of the district. And this is basically just a play to let Lincoln leave if they really want to. Uh, Lincoln has said they don't want to leave because if they do, then they lose effectively all control over this large piece of land which is in, and so they feel like they're compelled to stay simply because the school will be in their room building, uh, in their property. Um, but, this, uh, but this would say that Lincoln could leave if they want and the school could still exist in Lincoln. So uh, what we're going to be looking at on January 25th is a vote to support this new regional agreement, which is uh, which will it permit a number of towns to leave. Um, the one, Wayland, the current list of people who are declarants are Wayland, Boxborough, Sudbury, Carlisle's going to be on it. I feel like I'm forgetting that there's one more. Dover and Weston might also add themselves to the list. The only one there that I'm actually particularly concerned about is Sudbury. They're the ones who are closest to being a real size, but they're not that big. Belmont, Lancaster, Lexington, Arlington, the, I, I, I'm sorry, Needham, right? Those are all towns that are, are, are clearly going to stay. Concord's going to stay. Um, so we're going to be faced. We're going to faced. We're going to be able to support a new regional agreement that permits these towns that are relatively small out, and uh, that support agreement that is imperfect, but uh, it's definitely one that I can say and stand here and say we should do this deal. It puts us in such a better position than we would be otherwise. Um, I think we should separate it from the bond discussion, which I think we should have next. But even should the bond discussion succeed or fail, we are in a better position with this new regional agreement. And uh, I would look forward to your support at, a fu at this meeting or a future one. These towns that drop out, are they going to be able to send their kids to back to the school? They will. A bunch of them, for instance, are like, so for instance, uh, Sudbury in particular, yeah. their geographic location means that they are sitting at the junction of three different, like uh, it's Assabet and Minuteman, and I forget what the third one is. So I don't think that they'll have full send back, but yes, they absolutely will be able to. Uh, what's the percentage of the students of the uh, communities that want to withdraw? I haven't done that math yet. I don't remember off the top of my head. And Sudbury's, uh, definitely Sudbury's the biggest one. Um, yeah, Adams is less than 10. Uh, 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 okay. Yeah, something like that. 
Weston's won, Dover's won. Yeah, uh, uh, Weston's won, Dover's won. Uh, yeah, the Sun, of those, Sudbury is the biggest. Like, I think they're like eight, maybe they're 18. I don't I haven't looked at that chart recently enough to speak to that. Okay. Uh, Alan. I think at least part of the motivation to change the regional agreement is to reduce the barriers for some of the non member towns to join in and help. Has there been any communication with them or market research to, <coughs> to, to confirm that they like the direction? So there absolutely has been. And we have, and uh, these efforts have gone from through the school, you know, like Ed Bakul and the superintendent attempting conversations. They've been things like Adam talking to uh, mayors and the district. They've been at the legislative level trying to have those conversations. Um, they've been through the Mass School Building Authority. And uh, I will say that they've all, uh, oh, and a conversation with uh, Charlie Lyons, you know, saying like, okay, who can you talk to and who can you, you know, help us do? There has been nothing substantive successful on any of them, and some of them have been actively uh, negative about it. I will say that there have been the most small positive hints that Watertown has said, it, like they're looking at us shrinking Minuteman from a larger size to a smaller size, and some of the Watertown parents are like, oh wow, is my kid gonna get squeezed out of Minuteman? What should we do about it? But I would say any fruits on that are still far away. I would, agree, I would totally defend the statement that this regional agreement is a requirement to us ever getting success in that regard, but success is not close. Okay, Dean. Ash. Uh, John. It would seem to me that the only reason that a town would want to join is because it costs them more when they're outside. Is that so? Uh, is there any more to it than that? Uh, like, why would it? You mean? I'm sorry. Let's, let's, let's talk about water. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the only reason that they would be induced to join would be that they, it costs them more if they're not within the... There's two other minor reasons, or, or at least some, uh, <coughs> some think, uh, effective reasons, is uh, if you have enough of your students who go to a school, you want to have some element of control. And if you're, compl if you're sending 30 or 50 or 60 students to a school where you just have absolutely no control over what happens there, on some level that's frustrating and you, know, you don't have, like, you, know, you can't steer what the programs are going to be, you can't ensure the quality, you can't manage um, parents' concerns, things like that. The second reason is simply uh, to, to guarantee capacity. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a believer in necessarily in some of Minuteman's uh, projections, but if some of their projections sort of come true, then the sending towns are going to be taking up a bigger piece of a smaller school. And places like Watertown, Waltham, and Medford are going to be looking for somewhere else to put their kids. Not exactly holding my breath for that, but that would be a positive. Plus, I don't think Watertown has its own program. I believe it, right. It's so, Watertown uh, sends all its kids to Minutemen who want to go. They don't have a, they can't expand a program they already have. It doesn't exist. So, if they're going to get squeezed out, they might have an incentive to join. Okay, so any other questions on the regional agreement? Okay, so hopefully in the next uh, week, uh, a lot of this will come to uh, a head. And as soon as it does, if you could send copies of the latest and greatest. Um, we're going to have another meeting in mid-January, maybe the third week in January, uh, because a lot of the stuff simply we don't know yet, um, both on our own school programs and on this. So uh, the reason I, I asked Dan and, and Adam here is so everybody can get up to speed and think of all the questions. So once we do have a FinCom meeting later in January, we're going to have to uh, put the report together and get it out to town meeting, because town meeting meets on January 25th. So uh, anything I get, we get from Dan, you know, I will uh, shoot that right out to you so you can uh, you can see. And he has been working, uh, doing yeoman's work, and I'd like to thank him publicly for all the work he's done uh, over the last few months uh, on that. I appreciate it. One, one Sure. Uh, what is the status of the plans for the new school? Yes. I can follow that quite so I haven't talked about the bond article yet. Okay. So let, 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 let me. Let's, let me. Let, yeah. So um, they have plans. They're going to be approved by the school building authority. Um, the schematic design they've submitted is going to be approved. 
uh, the, the superintendent and is ready to vote and uh, put the bonding out. And so last night, his plan going into the meeting was to approve the regional agreement draft and approve um, the and have the Minuteman School Committee approve the bonding of the new building at 144 and a half million. Uh, he has interestingly agreed that the bond is contingent upon the regional agreement, which for us is a, to me a very significant uh, victory because it means that uh, we need to get the 16 yeses on the regional agreement before the bond vote becomes active. Uh, and so um, I, so one of the, so I was at the Minuteman School Committee meeting yesterday and Sue Shuffler, our, our, our representative was there yesterday and uh, we had some last minute conversations and our plan at the time was to vote yes on the regional <coughs> agreement. Um, I, just to complete the story, because I think this is, people will know about this and it'll be important. Uh, the link, the element of paying Lincoln for the host community has been taken out of the regional agreement, but it is trying, it is being done currently as a side agreement between Minuteman and Lincoln. So there are actually three votes yesterday that, that the school committee was looking to take. One, or Ed wanted the school committee to take. One was a side agreement with Lincoln approval. Two was regional agreement. Three was to put this the bond of for 144 and a half million forward. Um, and so he wants everybody at these special town meetings, and so part of what the selectmen did at these various meetings in Weston is that we've all agreed to call special town meetings, which for Arlington, of course, was easy because we were already calling it for Stratton. Uh, and um, so, but all the other towns so far, I mean, have agreed that they're going to call a special, and Ed's goal would be that they'd vote both the regional agreement and the bond. So Sue and I agreed that we were going to support Lincoln's side agreement. We're going to support the regional agreement, and we're going to ask to not support the bond agreement yet, because, um, and I believe that I really, I very much value this body's input on on this element of it, that we would be uh, faced with approving or disapproving a million and a half annual payment. Um, on a January 29th meeting without a clear way of how we pay for it. And so I'm trying, uh, so I continue, my job one, the thing I'm trying most is to get the regional agreement over the finish line. And the thing that I'm doing after that is I'm saying, you know, let's not talk about the building quite yet. Let's put that vote off. Let's delay it a little bit. The downside of that is that Minuteman um, believes that the costs will increase and that the you know the amount of school that you can get for 144 and a half million will go down if we, they delay by two months four months six months um, and the drop dead date is June 30th or July 30th I can't remember which okay so um, this article six would be for our approval or disapproval under the old agreement, or does it really matter? No, it really matters. So, okay. uh, so this if, is under the right. So imagine. So it's the school. It depends upon what the Minuteman School Committee does on Monday yeah. and on any subsequent meeting. But at any meeting, the Minuteman School Committee could say, "We seek to bond 144.5 million dollars, and uh, all you towns, you have 60 days to reply." Okay. And if they don't get 16 towns to say yes, or if, say, we're down to 12 towns, you know, 12 towns to say yes, um, one could certainly imagine that Ed is going to push forward to do the ballot option. Um, are people familiar enough with that, that <coughs> or should I talk about that? <coughs> yeah, I should explain. Okay. Yeah. Um, <coughs> there are two ways for Minuteman to get this debt approved. One is through unanimous consent of <coughs> each of the town meetings. And the second way is that Minuteman can call a district-wide ballot. And they get to set the date. The polls are only open for eight hours. And it's simply one man, one vote, yes or no, on whether or not to bond the building. And so uh, I have, uh, Minuteman has, or, or the superintendent has said, that he and other members of the school committee have said that if we don't get, if they don't get this, the, yet, the number of yeses they need from town meeting, that they will put it forward to this regional ballot. 
Um, and it's an interesting question <coughs> whether or not they're actually going to get enough votes on school committees to do that. <coughs> My personal estimation is that they will. And so uh, I won't be too surprised if we, do, if we, are, if we have a, a Minuteman regional ballot at <coughs> some point this spring. And uh, the question of that, by the time we get there, is whether or not I'm going to be supporting it or not. And whether or not I'm going to be supporting it or not is really dependent upon, first of all, whether or not we have a regional agreement, full stop, <coughs> and whether or not we as a town come to agreement on whether or not we can pay for it and how we would do that. Which will probably need a debt exclusion. Which would probably need a debt exclusion. Because we're talking a million and a half to two million dollars of annual debt service, so it's, it's a lot of money. <coughs> on the vote, of, uh, which, which vote, vote? which was talked about the bond vote? Yeah, bond vote. Does it? How do they count that? Each town, or overall. Overall. So the what do they take for a number then? How do they get the number? Is it for a majority or? It is simple majority across sixteen. So <coughs> we would open our polls exactly like we would for a yeah. local election or anything except with the with the unusual caveat that it's only for eight hours um, because this is specified by. And state they count law. the number of registered voters. For the, okay. No, not the number of registered. The number of people who actually cast votes. So it's a turnout game, oh, if nothing else. You. So we. So if Arlington yeah. feels passionately yeah. about Minuteman, we're going to have to run a serious turnout machine to make right. sure that we get yeah. the, what we want. I get you. Okay, Charlie. <coughs> Dan, when when will the regional agreement be in place or not in place? Um, I don't believe that the new regional agreement will actually kick in until the December following the July. So I believe it would be 12 months from now, but I'd want to double check that. Because if there is in the re regional agreement, the clause that says that the town votes against the capital expenditure and um, it gets passed anyway. <coughs> it votes against it on, at, at the uh, town meeting level and in the referendum. It doesn't have to pay the, uh, yeah. it, has, it has a way out of paying for the capital. I don't think that that will apply because we'll still be under the old rules. Under the old or the new? Okay. Uh, I, I thought the language was that if a community voted to get out and was not allowed out, but the debt went forward, it wouldn't be subject to pay. Still has to vote no. But it has to vote no. But I don't think I think it, I think the the key part is you also have to uh, vote to, to withdraw. Have to request to withdraw. Yeah, yeah, not just vote against it. Yeah, um, Charlie, I haven't inquired to be sure, but I don't think that that applies to <clears throat> this case because we haven't gotten to that new regional agreement yet. Okay, Brian. Okay, um, so the bond is going to be for 144 million. 144 uh, and a half. I'd have to roughly. Yeah. roughly. Um, there's a 30 percent reimbursement. Is that correct? So, um, so just so you know, I am laser focused on the regional agreement, and there's all this building stuff on the side. So I'm going to give you my building stuff on the side, not complete answer, and you'll just have to. I'm going to give you the best that I can, but please consult documents for better answers. Um, it's a 44% reimbursement okay, so on the reimbursable costs. Right. And I haven't seen an explicit breakdown of which parts are reimbursable and which parts aren't. So I don't know what the total reimbursement rate. It's roughly a third, last I heard. Okay. The business can be, I'm just bringing the numbers in, it's going to be very significant. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a big chunk. Yeah. Alan? Um, just from your peripheral vision, assuming the regional agreement uh, revisions go through. Uh, is there consensus that it's the right building, the right size? Uh, maybe, that was the building itself <laughs> supported? So, um, there definitely, I would not describe it as a full raging consensus that it is the right size. The thing <laughs> that uh, settled a lot of the debate related to the size is a memo that came from the Mass School Building Authority in July, May, sometime this summer. And what they said explicitly was something that they hadn't ever said before, which is they will fund a vocational school with fewer than 600 students. And so at that point, the, 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 like, so right now it's 628. And, imagine, and so I think my personal argument on this went, so if we want the state's money, it's got to, the difference between 600 and 628 does not matter. And, and if we made, I can definitely see an argument that the size of the school should be 400 or 350 or something like that. But if we're doing that, we're doing it without the state's money. And so, uh, and I also haven't 
you know, been able to, like, that's not a choice that I get to, you know, actually make. Um, so is the, there is, a, there is not a, a strong consensus on the 628. I will say that the, one of the things that does happen is that with this new regional agreement is that it becomes um, a district of the willing which is, I think, a really po positive development. That a lot, of these, a lot of these very negative and very naysayer and not productive you know, aspects of the district go away. And I think that some of the conversations will become easier uh, when, uh, when, when, the, when, the when there's fewer on the table. It sounds like there may still be a discussion about the building on its own merits, of whether it's the right building. I absolutely think that that, that conversation absolutely should happen and I encourage uh, the Capital Planning Committee and the Finance Committee and everybody else to have that conversation. Okay, Dean? And, and just off of that, just so we're all on the same page, sort of linking back to the earlier discussion. If I understand the discussion on the building is you have, you know, you have member children, children in school who are from member districts and children in school from <coughs> member districts. And some of the members of the school committee want to build a school that would fit all of them, and some of them effectively just want to throw the non-member kids out and say, we're going to have a 400-kid school, which is why when we were talking earlier about what's the benefit of membership, if there are certain people there on the school committee that do not think Watertown's kids should go at all, that do not think Waltham's kids should go at all, and that's where the, the, the issue becomes the membership, non-membership, which is they could find themselves out. And like you say, and I think you should put it best, where Sudbury has other options. Watertown doesn't. I mean, they bought, they bought, for, they, they have bought Belmont, Boston, and Newton. So this, it would be much more difficult for them to go somewhere else. <coughs> and you're absolutely right. And the, the thing that, so the people who are advocating for the smaller schools, say the 400 person school, I think the thing that really took the wind out of their sails was the state saying, we're not going to pay for that under any circumstances. And I think that that really, I mean, who knows? Maybe the, this is all going to fail, and maybe that's where we're going to be talking about in a year or two anyway. But uh, it did take it out of the current debate in my, from my perspective. Paul? Just a nitty gritty question. The eight hour election, would it be in two, uh, does it have to be eight hours consecutive, or do you do four hours in the morning or four hours in the evening? I actually, I really, I did go and I read the, read the statute on this one, and um, uh, I don't believe it would permit you to do two. There's a world where they would set, like, there's a timeline that they put up a month ago or something like that on the screen that had the uh, Minuteman ballot on April 2nd, which is also our election. And, uh, like, like exactly, that, that becomes kind of horrifying at that point. At that point, I think we go to court and we do things like we ask them to hold open, you know, have the, the, the ballot be open for the full hours that we're open because otherwise it's just untenable. But let's just hope that none of that comes to pass. Okay, so you can see we have a lot of issues on re revolving around Minuteman, and, and I think uh, we'll need discussion. That's why I wanted to get it going now, and then we'll uh, hopefully finish it up. It sounds to me like now, though, we could take a vote. You would recommend that we take a vote on uh, denying way of no action vote. I would vote yes, and uh, if if you saw fit to call a vote on the regional agreement, I mean, I am pushing the regional agreement now, and if we could, if I could. Get you to say call a vote on that too. I will. Uh, I don't, I'm not asking you to vote on the bond. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Dean, why is Article Seven a vote of the Finance Committee? Regional agreement. No, way out of the Cost us more money. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. I didn't. Why is that our vote? Well, way out of the That's the selection. Well, it, the it's uh, <clears throat> we've been involved in this sort of right from the beginning. Uh, and, and two of our people have been on, involved in the uh, committees that created it. Um, you know, is it an appropriation? No, but I think we should. Okay. I mean, we should take a stand on it. Charlie? Yeah, I move no action on Article 7. Okay, so motion has been made for no action on Article 7, which is uh, to deny Wayland uh, the ability to withdraw under the old rules. Is there a second? Second. Okay, is there any discussion on that? Okay, all those in favor of no action on Article 7 on Wayland, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Okay, all those in favor of no action on Wayland, please raise your hand.
17. Opposed? Okay, so that motion carries. And on the regional agreement, um, this would be to basically approve the regional agreement, amendments to the regional agreement as you've laid out. Yeah, though, as I realize that since you don't actually have the language in front of you, it's probably, I'm probably pushing too hard. What do you think, Chuck? Uh, well, I, I, I think uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, yeah. support the regional agreement as uh, Dan has described it. I, I have to say that, uh, first of all, I think Dan did a yeoman job in uh, explaining this complex pri uh, process here in uh, you know 20 minute extemporaneous discourse <coughs> which I uh, highly applaud but uh, it, it pales in comparison to the effort that he's put in to get this regional agreement uh, in place with these towns over the last uh, uh, 60 or 90 days and um, from my view the the only substantive change in the regional agreement I mean the, the, the protocol and letting some towns out and so forth is, are, are somewhat peripheral the singular change is, is uh, the, the uh, going to a one student instead of a five student minimum on the capital allocation process uh, or, pro, or a formula. And uh, you know, I think in, in exchange for all of the benefits that we would get, and we've already voted for this regional agreement uh, in the past, and town meeting has voted for it. So I think uh, all the benefits that we would get from uh, the from this regional agreement uh, with the revision that uh, Dan has proposed, I think outweigh the negatives uh, on the capital allocation uh, formula. So I would uh, hardly, hardly support um, uh, his proposal on that, and I move a favorable action on Article 8. We have a second. Okay. okay. Any, <coughs> any discussion? Okay, Alan? I, I, I guess I'd like to ask Dan's opinion about the benefits of um, voting tonight versus voting in mid-January. Um, since, you know, we, we haven't actually read it or anything. Yeah. Yet. So, one of the things that I said at the Board of Selectmen's meeting when we talked about this 10 days ago was that, so during the discussion at the Selectmen's meeting, I got a, a varying degrees of feedback of, Dan, you're working really hard on this, and we, you're, you've been keeping us pretty well updated, and for that reason, we're going to support just about anything you say that isn't crazy. <laughs> and, I really, and I really appreciated that, but it also <clears throat> has given me a lot of leverage when I talk to these other 16 towns, because I can say, I've got to vote at the Finance Committee, I've got to vote at the Board of Selectmen, I've got to vote at the Town Meeting, I am speaking for the town. And there are a lot of people at that table who don't have the same um, solid foundation. And so, in, in so far as that I feel like I really am representing this body's opinion and these other bodies' opinions, um, it really gives me um, strength at that negotiating table. So, so this isn't a binding vote, but it's a good vote of confidence, right? I can say, like, I can go to the, like, I can go to the selectmen tomorrow, and I can say, last night I was at the Arlington Finance Committee meeting. I laid it all out, and they are in favor of this regional agreement. And we've already, we've already passed it. What two years ago? Uh, yeah. You know, ninety-nine percent of it. On that. Yes, yeah, we haven't read it, but, but, but yeah, I, I know. I support support it. Simply, yeah. Simply is a little bit We're going to be meeting on this again, yeah. and if, if some people want to take a new vote, that that'd be fine. But right now, uh, uh, I, I'd encourage you to vote favorable to help support, you know, Dan and the town in getting these things done. So, uh, any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the favorable action supporting the. Uh, Proposed regional agreement, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you for your support. We've got an unanimous vote. And we'll save the school construction until later. For sure. Okay, thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. Okay, now let's work, uh, let's see what we're doing here time-wise. Right to bargaining, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the committee should have a, a memo before it uh, in regards to uh, collective bargaining and AFSME, the AFSME union. Uh, so very quickly at town meeting, we had agreements with all six bargaining, uh, bargaining units uh, with only one uh, <coughs> remaining to be ratified by the actual bargaining unit, which was AFSME. So at town meeting in the spring, there was funding put in place for all six bargaining units, including AFSME, uh, the, but the funding for AFSME was subject to them ratifying it by a deadline of May 20th. They did not ratify that agreement. So we went back to the bargaining table with them uh, and came to an agreement 
uh, in September. The um, terms, uh, the financial terms of that agreement are outlined in the memo. It's a cost of living increase of 2% for FY16, FY17, and FY18, and an adjustment to their snow and ice incentive. The adjustment really is the employees, uh, D, pre uh, predominantly DPW, would start with a snow and ice, uh, ice incentive and would lose it as they missed uh, snow and ice events. Now they actually will earn a snow and ice incentives as they report to uh, snow and ice snow and ice events. So you can see the FY16 cost, 17, 18, and then total cost on the second page, uh, as well as a draft vote uh, with the bottom line uh, that I would ask the committee um, recommend be appropriate at the special town meeting. Uh, it is appropriate to note that the amount of money that was set aside for AFSCME as part of the prior bargaining agreement in the spring was approximately $166,000 uh, for FY16. This agreement totals just about $144,000. Okay. Um, the one thing that bothers me a bit is the uh, uh, all the other unions have agreed to biweekly payroll. Um, this one does not have it. So uh, I guess why was that the case and will you, how will you move forward now with bi uh, biannual, uh, biannual, biweekly uh, payroll with, will you move forward with the other units? So uh, very briefly, the, the prior uh, bargaining agreement that had been before town, uh, the committee and the town meeting in the spring <coughs> did have the AFSCME bargaining unit moving to biweekly payroll. Uh, though I, I'm not in the minds of those who voted on it, uh, my understanding is that they, uh, the primary reason they voted down that agreement was the presence of biweekly. Uh, so it is not contained in this agreement. There's also less financial, uh, a smaller financial package included uh, in the agreement that's before you. We're working on rolling out biweekly pay for the remainder of um, the bargaining units, as all have been agreed to sometime over the course of the next year. Uh, and I would, I, I'd like to, to hold out that for the next, uh, the next round of negotiations, that you know there would not be an agreement without biweekly pay for AFSCME. Okay. Any questions, Alan? Are there any other differences uh, between this and the May, May proposal? So uh, in, the, in the May proposal, there had been a one-time uh, payment. There had been a longevity adjustment and a one-time payment to go to biweekly. So that longevity adjustment's gone. The one-time payment clearly is gone, and the snow and ice incentive is included. The snow and ice changed. Right? Yes. Okay. Will the snow and ice changes cost any additional funds? So frankly, you know, it's, it's a tough one to put a guaranteed number on. Uh, there's already <laughs> a snow and ice incentive in place. Um, so there may be no net cost. Uh, there, there may be a net savings. There may be a net cost. So I, I have plugged in here what I think would be a worst case scenario for increased cost. Uh, Brian? No, I just got the answer to my question. Thanks. Okay. Uh, other questions? Uh, Dick? Yeah. What is this snow and ice incentive? How do you, set, how do you work that or what is it? So the way, what, what, what happened in this agreement and the way, the way it used to be was, Every employee who reported the snow and ice events started with a snow and ice incentive of $500. Everybody was allowed to miss one snow and ice event and not be penalized. But then if you missed a second, your incentive goes to 400. If you missed a third, your incentive goes to 300, and so on and so forth. <coughs> what we saw happen last year when we had 29 snow and ice events, not everybody gets called in for every event. But a lot of the, the, the big truck drivers that both sand and plow, they do come in for every event. So we had employees who worked, let's say, eight events who got their 500 because they didn't miss any. They, they got called for eight and they showed up for eight. And we had some other employees who worked 27 of the 29, or let's say 26 of the 29, and they got $300 because they couldn't make three. When you really look at it, that seems to be a bit of a perverse disincentive uh, or, or, or not necessarily commensurate with the effort put forth. So we swapped it or switched it to be you earn it. Now it's for every four that you show up to, $100 incentive. Next four, 100 so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, Paul? So if you don't get much snow, it's to the town's benefit? That, that's accurate. <laughs> 
<laughs> in, in a lot of ways. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions on the collective bargaining agreement? Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. I would like, if nobody has any objections, it disturbs me a bit, you know, that everybody else is going to move to bi biweekly uh, bi payroll and, and this one won't. And there was, a, there was an incentive there. So I'd uh, uh, like to add a comment which people can take a look at uh, or, or maybe just speak before town meeting that, that uh, uh, you know, this will be a factor in how we look at the next one uh, for, for this union, which of course won't be in a couple of years. But, uh, on that, so. Um, okay, any other discussion? All those in favor of accepting the collective bargaining agreement as presented, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Okay, now the big one. Schools. Okay, so, yes. Favorable action. Okay, now we've got three school articles, two, three, and four. Now, two of them deal with the strat. So article two deals with the modular classrooms. Uh, this looks like it. Uh, well, we haven't decided how we're going to how we're going to pay for it, whether it's borrowing or cash. Are you making a recommendation on that score, or will you be? It's, it's borrowing in the capital plan as it exists now. I'm sorry. It's borrowing in the capital. Plan. So in, in the capital plan, it's, it's borrowing as it exists uh, as it currently exists. Okay, it's already in the capital plan. Uh, it actually was in the capital plan uh, last year. Um, so, um, first of all, we have a capital planning committee meeting tomorrow night, and, and um, so the and this is one of the items that have to be addressed. But let me just give you a uh, thirty thousand foot view here. So the, um, the plan that was proposed last year for the Stratton School was that uh, the, the renovation of the school uh, itself directly would cost somewhat more than ten million dollars. In addition, there would be approximately, uh, I think it was a million, million plus, um, about uh, maybe 1.1 million for uh, the the, uh, the rental of uh, modular classrooms to house students in uh, during the, the renovation process. And then uh, this, uh, at, at our last capital planning meeting, uh, Adam presented a report from the uh, Permanent Town Building Committee that the cost of the project was actually going to go up uh, by about eight hundred ninety thousand dollars. This is uh, market costs, you know, uh, materials, labor, et cetera, in the in the in the uh, estimate of the of the architects. Uh, and in the course of uh, discussions, uh, the, the permanent town building committee recommended making certain changes to reduce the scope of the project a little bit in, in order to con constrain some of those increased costs, but the net after, after those reductions is on the order of uh, $890,000. So um, this first Article 2 is to fund the modular classrooms because um, they have to be purchased <coughs> and or ordered and purchased early in order for them to arrive and be installed in time for the September school year. If we waited to this uh, annual town meeting, um, they wouldn't get done in time so that the whole project would slip by a year. Um, because the, you, you can't really act on an annual town meeting expenditure until after uh, July 1st when the um, Department of Revenue or who's the uh, authority, some, somebody has to approve all of the financial articles in the, in the uh, town meeting. So um, the second article um, is, is also, you know, we're not really able to give you a, a number today or exactly how, how we think we're going to pay for this. I mean, we have, we have a, a plan to pay for it, but, but the, to actually put it down into specific dollars and cents, uh, is, we're, not, we're not exactly at that point yet. But um, 
it would be <coughs> timely since we have a town meeting and since the the members of the Stratton community have been waiting for 16 years since the rebuild authorization in 2000 to get this project completed um, to to review and, and vote the uh, entire amount for the um, Stratton renovation at this town meeting and that way uh, the project could go forward and that's the reason for the second article there now was there any money appropriated in the capital plan last year for, uh, we, for we, we, have, we did appropriate money for the plans for the for the uh, okay. Stratton school last year and in the capital budget we we gave a uh, pro forma okay. uh, financing plan for the Stratton which included some money from the non-exempt capital budget some revenue from the sale of the newly found and owned town property at the Disabled American Veterans Building uh, on Mass Avenue and some funds from the um, from the uh, rebuild um, debt exclusion of 2000. So uh, and, and that and, and the amount of those funds and how that actually uh, would, would pass is still under review by the town manager, the capital planning committee and the town comptroller. Okay, so when do you think you would have numbers for us for Article 2 and 3? Sometime in, say, mid-January? So I can, may I? So bids for the modular classrooms, the temporary space, uh, will be opened on January 8th. So they'll be vetted for that week, but we'll have numbers as of January 8th or there, there around. Yeah. You'll then have 90% construction design estimates for uh, Article 3 for the actual construction project sometime I think we're going to get those on January 18th so we're, we're, we're coming in very close to the actual town meeting and though historically we've only asked the Capital Planning Committee and Finance Committee and town meeting to approve actual uh, bid amounts in this case, in order to kick off the construction as soon as kids vacate the building at the end of June, we want to award based on the 90% uh, ninety percent construction. Did you say uh, the 18th? Yeah, is that a Monday? It's uh, Luther King Day. So it's Monday, yeah. So the 19th. Okay. Because uh, the town meeting is the 25th. I was thinking of having a finance committee meeting on the 13th. That's the prior Wednesday. Chris, is there anything illegal about us meeting on the on the Martin Luther King holiday? Uh, I don't know if people are going to be away. So. I don't know if it's, <coughs> if it's illegal. The buildings are closed, but yeah. Okay, so so I think we'll have to look at this. Will we have? The bids, we'll have the bids for the modulars and the 90% uh, estimates by the 13th. I don't so we can I, vote it? I, I, we, might, you know, we might have the 90% estimates. They won't be fully vetted yet. We, so we have the architect take a look at the estimates. Then we also have an owner's project manager do a constructability analysis and a separate cost estimate and then have them come together to come to a consolidated number. Um, I can, you know what, I, I, I can question see if we can have a figure okay because I was thinking of meeting the 13th if we meet the 20th that's getting pretty close to uh, town meeting granted it's not a real big uh, thing to put together we could probably figure out a way to mail it on the 21st so people can have it by the 22nd or 23rd yep. <coughs> I don't know if that would be acceptable to the town meeting members but it might be the best we can do if people could keep the 13th of January open and the 20th, those are two Wednesdays. So 113 and 120. And we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll get as much information to you as we can. Uh, okay, are, are there any questions? Now, my understanding is that. Instead of spreading the modulars around the town, all the modulars for the Stratton will be at the Stratton. That's correct. Okay. Uh, okay, Dick. Will you own, will we own those or lease them? They'll be leased for one year. Lease. Yep. Tom. That was your question. Okay. 
Any other questions from what you've got now? Dick? What about the Thompson? She said she's going to need a couple down there. Is, is that involved in this at all? It's, it's not involved, though. We, we have an open question out to the architect to see whether or not extending the lease, getting two extra on there, how we can work that in as part of the next discussion for enrollment issues. Okay. So any information we get on this, we'll just email to you, you know, as soon as we have it. Uh, and please keep those two dates open. And uh, Okay, are there any other questions on two or three? So once the modulars, they'll all be set up up there at the Stratton, and the other is the renovation, uh, the actual building construction and renovation. Okay, uh, the last one, I always leave the best for the last, is... Uh, is the <coughs> capital budget school capacity expansion. Uh, there's been a, a, a task force, I guess you'd want, uh, put together, uh, led by our very able town manager, and uh, consists of two selectmen, uh, two or three, three school committee, uh, myself, uh, as chair of the finance committee, Charlie Foskett is chair of the capital budget committee. John Cole is chair of the uh, one, of the uh, permanent town building committee. Uh, and we've been looking at all the uh, at all the numbers, and there's been a lot of numbers. Uh, you know, starting in 2013, the enrollment started to go up more steadily. Before that. It would go up, it would go down a little bit. It, it was sort of going sideways. But started in 2013, the, the enrollment seemed to steadily increase. Uh, the school committee uh, hired an uh, uh, individual to do a projection. Uh, the, the, the school department has always had projections, but they're based upon if what happens in the future is the same thing that happens now, so it's just a straight mathematical projection. It, it's, it hasn't gone into examining who's moving into town, who's moving out of town, things like that. Um, so they hired the individual, what's his name? Uh, Kibben. yeah. Kibbins. To, uh, to do an analysis, and I think that came up with the, uh, that over the next 10 years, we would have an increase in the school enrollment of 1,000. Uh, so we started on that basis. Um, Unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon how you look at it, the very first year after the projection was made, uh, the, instead of going up 184 students as was projected in the study, it went up 100. It went up 84 students. So it was automatically 100 below projection. So the question we don't know is, is that, is, is October 1, 2015, is, is that where it's going to be? Is it going to go down? Or is that just a, a blip that's going to go back up again? We just, we just don't know. Uh, and so the group has been meeting twice now, uh, throwing out everything. You've probably seen it in the advocate and on the list and, uh, and such, all the different alternatives uh, put forth. Uh, uh, the, the Thompson is sort of, this is an East Arlington problem. It, it, that's where the growth seems to be coming. And if you wander around East Arlington, you'll see you know, house after house being torn down uh, and uh, little single families being torn down and big duplexes going up. Um, uh, so it is East Arlington problem. They've gotten to the point now uh, where the Hardy has two classrooms available. Next year, they will be full. The Thompson basically has no classrooms available. Uh, and if you look at, one of the things to look at is the, one of the, the studies, these are really sort of helpful because they give you, uh, you know, the classrooms, the number of classrooms and the amount in each. And I, I think these are really very helpful. But for example, if you take a look at the Thompson, the fifth grade, which is gonna be moving on to the uh, Audison, is only two. But you look down into the kindergarten and first grade, and those are four. So if this goes ahead as projected, uh, we um, two classes move out, four classes move in. You know, we're down two classes. Um, 
And, and so, you know, what are the alternatives? How do you house those? Well, they only, they have one, uh, um, I sort of did a tour of the Thompson today with, with Adam and uh, uh, with the superintendent and the principal. Uh, the only school, the classroom they really have available is the uh, art room. Um, so if you, you know, you do art on wheels, that takes care of one. What do you do with the other 25 kids? Well, maybe they can balance them out with the Hardy and um, there's certain circumstances. So for example, if you look at, um, let's take first grade, uh, at the Hardy and the Thompson, you've got eight classes there. If you make those into seven classes, it boosts the enrollment of each to like 23, but now you've saved the classroom. So, you know, they're looking into, um, you know, shifting kids back and forth between the Hardy and the Thompson to save a classroom. But, um, uh, you know, so these are all the different things that are being suggested. Now, in addition to that, you have the uh, Odyssey is, is getting very full. Um, and so uh, you probably saw it. one wants to build a fifth, one proposal was to build a fifth and sixth grade uh, school on the uh, woods above the Odyssey, uh, which would be intriguing. Um, another is that uh, to move the eighth grade class into the high school. And we're gonna be hearing very soon about the uh, high school, whether MSBA is going to approve it or not. So that, you know, there's various things being looked at. Um, you know, my sort of goal was not to spend a lot of money until we see how this enrollment is going. But, uh, so those are the things being discussed now. And this, um, and this article was put as a placeholder uh, if the task force is able to come up with a couple of specifics. So for example, if two more demountables were put at the Thompson, this could be the appropriation of money to fund those two demountables. So we have the two classes at the uh, Thompson uh, and at least for a year, um, you know, they can keep the art room, have the two classes, but it, you know, then you get to another year. Um, do we build uh, permanent demountables at the Thompson? Do we put an addition at the Thompson? Um, those all take longer than than permanent uh, than the temporary. So I don't know. That's sort of uh, a little bit of an overview. And I know uh, uh, Charlie was there. I know Peter was there. Dean was there. Uh, Dick was there. Um, so Adam, do you want to start with you? Do you want to add anything? Can you add anything to the issues? Okay. Um, so anyway, that's why that's there. Any of the people who were there want to add anything? Let's try to just sort of give an overview. I want, Dick? I want to ask a question. And I've been hearing that the, to take and move a class into the Gibbs, it's going to, to take and bring that up to code, it's going to be $20 million. Where did the, <coughs> that figure come from, or is it true, or what? So th that's simply the architect that the school department hired to do a feasibility study on sort of the whole issue. Not a feasibility study, just really a report on possibilities. It, it's a square footage. T take an industry standard for square footage and, and do the multiplication. There's, there's no plan behind that. Because it's operating now, it must be partially up to code. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the question is necessarily up to code, it's up to standard of of, oh, it's up to the old 2015 code. It would be school. the old code. It should be grandfather. Yeah, okay. I, I went through it with Adam today because one of the issue, one of the questions that came up, actually Diane Mahan raised it first and I sort of jumped in on it, was maybe we could use the, strat, the Gibbs, like two or three classrooms in the Gibbs plus yeah. the gym uh, for a satellite. Mm. I don't know, for those who have been around here forever, you know, they, they had some satellite campuses back in the 70s. Uh, we, instead of, you know, demountables, we could send the fifth grade up to the, uh, to the Gibbs, and that's a satellite. Uh, in, in walking through the, the Gibbs, though, we were looking at the top floor, which is where all the art is, and it, 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 it's, the classrooms, they're small, they're um, not the most appealing, I, I just don't see. Plus, you'd have classrooms there with private studios. So you'd have you know individuals walking through a school area. It doesn't add to security. 
Uh, and then we looked at a couple of classrooms down where the girls' gym used to be, the girls' locker room used to be, and it's too small. It, it's, you know, it, it has a folding door across it, but each side would be four or 500 square feet. It, it's, it's way too small for that. So um, it, needs a, it would need a lot of work, I think. Alan? How about the DAV? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, <laughs> just, just to throw it on the table, there's also uncertainty about the Uber site, which could be another couple hundred families, potentially, in so many years. Yeah, we don't know. Okay. Dean? So <coughs> I handed out, I sent it on email today, and I handed out this um, four page handout. So if I could just take a minute to go over some of these, some of the key things. I thought when I put it together, it was a little bit helpful in trying to understand it. So if you we use the top six If you go to the back of page one, this is the October 2009 report. So it comes all the way to the right. And if you just go down the line, fifth grade to ten, you know, class size, you know, the grade levels, right? You have 42, 51, 57, 55, 47, 63. So the low class is fifth grade of 42, the high class is kindergarten of 63, and they're all in that sort of 50 something range. So if you go to the front of the first page, that's the enrollment report as of today. Same report, same measurement, and what else. If you start in the back of your head and you say to yourself, all right, we were just in that, let's say, 50 something range of your Wisconsin. Now you go through that same grade level. The first year, fifth grade of 59, 49. But then you get big, 81, 73, 81, 82. And so I think that does a great job of articulating what the problem is in some of these schools. Primarily, when you do the same analysis, you see that the Thompson and the Hardy have the biggest challenge. And so what I think it, where I think this helps people, what I think it helps people understand is, you would just to assume for a moment that each incoming Thompson grade is between, let's say, 80 and 88 kids. And I use that because that would give you an average class size of 20 to 22, right? Which with 22 not being all that great, but clearly not the 26 they put my kid in last year at Dolan. Um, that would, that would mean each year we have a shortage of classrooms at Thompson, right? So, as Al said, two kids leave, two, two classrooms leave fifth grade, which by the way is unreasonably large at 30 kids a class. So two, two classrooms leave, but they'd be replaced by four. By four. So right now, if I, let me back one sec. Right now they're about minus one, right? Because they had to fit. As Al said, they only had one room in the art room, but they had to put 60 kids in two rooms. So right now they're already minus one on a row, you could say, right? So next year, they go to minus two because they replace 60 kids, two rooms, with 80 kids, four rooms. The following year, they replace another large class of two with a class of four again. So now they go from you know, minus two to minus four. And so that's sort of the, the gist of the issue. And then I guess you could jump, you'd be fine for a year, then two years later, the second grade, you'd now be minus five if they were replaced by a class of of 80. And so that's where the McKibben Report effect effectively shows the challenge just sort of building up each year. And also I think does um, sort of leans to the, the, the challenge all around, which is, you know, we don't know for certain that it's minus going to be five classroom need over the course of several years, but we have to, we have to start planning and getting ready to do something about it. Um, and then you kind of hope that it never jumps from, you know, I say 80 to 88 is comfort of saying, or at least it's okay if it were to jump somewhere up to 100, we have a whole nother problem. Um, but I think those that the first page front and back does a good job by school of explaining how this problem is sort of building and growing over the years and how it is projecting out to continue to grow. Um, if you go to the third page, which is the front of the second page, this is the school department's 10 year enrollment history the projected enrollment. They go back several years and then it's projecting forward several years. Um, I think this does a couple things. First, it <coughs> partly shows the history and then the projection, but it also helps people um, understand the issue across, um, across the grade levels. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, using those same metrics of elementary school, I should have pointed out, you see that the elementary schools have really grown significantly. Like they've gotten like really big. But the middle school hasn't gotten really big because the middle school, which is at 1130 rate, 1,130 kids right now, was at 1,065 kids 
back in 2009. So it's a net growth of about 60 children. So I think that helps with a couple thoughts. It, it sort of one helps show that the growth is coming from the bottom grades and pushing upward, not coming in from all angles. I mean, I think we had a meeting, with, we've had some meetings with the school department where they tell us that growth comes in from every grade proportionally every single year, okay? And there, it, it doesn't prove out that way when you just look at the simple numbers. The elementary schools, I think, have grown 18%. The middle school's grown 8%. There's a, there's, a, there's a material gap. Now, of course, as these large classrooms keep moving up through the system, they're eventually going to push their way into the middle school and, and make the problem really, really bad there. I, mean, I, think, it's, <coughs> I think they've articulated sort of at a breaking point right now based on the educational model they have, which they call, a, I think, a cluster model. I'm gonna, I made, maybe I made that up. But it will, it will continue to, to break it as we get up there. Um, and then there, I, it also shows, I think, some of the challenges with the, the demographics, because if you just go diagonally across a grade level, one of the things you notice on this chart is when we move from fifth, historically when you move from fifth grade to sixth grade, sixth grade to seventh grade, you have drop-offs in enrollment because kids are going to private schools, they're going to alternative education choices when they, when they leave elementary school. And I think what this chart shows is it shows how that has historically worked, but it doesn't, from a, from a demographic perspective, it's, it, it also creates some challenges moving forward. Because if you say 20, 25 kids a year leave to go to private schools, as Arlington's enrollment, and that's, let's say, 10% of the grade, as the enrollment, as the big grades come through, you're still going to lose 10% or you're going to lose 25 kids still. You know, in other words, let's take the jump to from 6 to 7th. Just because we're 100 kids larger in each grade, is Belmont Hill or BBNN or whatever school going to take a larger number of kids? I think it's probably not. So it sort of shows and helps people as they're, as they're trying to work through that. Um, and I know, I'm going to look over to Brian, because I know he's going to ask me this question. Um, you will notice that the, this report does not tie to the report on page one when you look at the number of kids. Um, I believe that the school department on this includes the kids that they send out of district. So this is the enrollment of Arlington children in some form of public education, whereas the front page, which is the reason I, I put that on the front and use that more, is the kids that are physically in a town of Arlington building that we're, that we're using. Um, and then the last page on the back of page two shows just the current classroom needs as of 2015, 2016, and then how many, you know, quote unquote, extra classrooms they have and, you know, their ability or inability to, to move things around. And, you know, sort of going back to the Thompson as I, I sort of articulated the, how you project out the kids going and that situation getting worse over time. You know, they said they sit here and they say they have you know 19 classrooms to use extra spaces. No, I mean like our Al said they could try to gap it for one year with art on a cart, but you know, even if you bridge it for a year, let's say we can we can do that, right? It, there's no room after that, and that's what this is trying to get to. Is there's just no space beyond that. So I thought that these these four pages are sort of looking simple on the on the face, but really are impactful in terms of just getting your head around what the the issue is and sort of mentally trying to figure out how it's gonna keep getting worse. Okay, thank you for putting that together, Dean, and your explanation. You can see if you go to the third page, which is the you know projection, is that um, this was a problem which really sort of popped up in fiscal 2013. So before that, you know, uh, fiscal 7, 07, down 18, down 57. Then you had two years that it popped up a bit, then it was down uh, 32 up, six down. You know, it, it was going all over. And then in 13, wham. And that's when the school department came to us looking for some extra money uh, through the long term plan. And we put together the growth factor and all that. Uh, so we've been, you know, we've been trying to provide extra money to the schools for to take care of their operating costs, but now, uh, you know, now there's a classroom shortage, at least in, in certain areas. Mary Margaret? Uh, well, I was just thinking that back when we built the Thompson and we put the eighth grade in the high school, there were definitely some social and cultural problems with having that many kids in that big an age range in the high school. Yeah. So I just caution people to think back to what, when we did that before. 
yeah, I, I, you know, none of this is ideal. I mean, whatever solution we're going to come up with, we'll, we'll have uh, we'll have drawbacks to it. Um, but that's a fairly large campus there. Um, other thoughts or suggestions or comments, or Carol? <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, you know that, that's something we did. In fact, I think in the 70s we even used the Boys and Girls Club. I yeah, think we did. We did. Okay. Yeah. You, had, uh, you, for, you for, even had night school. I'm sorry. You even had night school at the Boys and Girls Club. Split no. se uh, two sessions. Two sessions. Yeah. yeah. Split sessions. I had one kid in the morning one, one the other. One. <clears throat> yeah. So, the, so these are trying the issues the task force is trying to deal with, and I I have a feeling that you know there'll be. A request for some kind of money, for some kind of a, uh, a, a short term, because you, you can't build either the permanent amountables or new s classrooms uh, by next September. But you could put, for example, temporary amountables in by then. John, uh, our kids were right in the middle of that Sutton High School business, and. As it occurred, that is to say, before they went to the satellite school, we were terrified <coughs> that it would be an awful situation. It turned out to be fabulous. For three or four years in the satellite schools, they had a marvelous time. It was really wonderful. For what it's worth, that's just right. Fun. Where else was it besides the Boys and Girls Club? Well, what's that? Yeah. The, the satellite. Uh, they Central, had Central School. Central School oh, was Central another school. one. Right over here. Right, right yeah. Here. Central School. And before that, I, I can remember when there was portables on the Pier School. And they, um, my oldest son went to fourth or fifth grade in the portables. He never stepped his, put his foot inside the building, the regular building. Uh, Dick? The, the problem using the satellites is parents get really upset, but the kids take and go right into it and mm -hmm. it doesn't bother them at all. It bothers the parents. Not kids. Yeah. Any other comments, Charlie? It just, uh, if I could, it, it, when you study the school the history of the schools and you look back, even way back in the 20s when they, when they built the Pierce School and the Hardy School, soon after they built them, they had to put additions on them. It's like it's history repeats itself. Uh, when they built the Stratton School, soon after they finished the Stratton School in the late 50s, they had to put an addition onto it. Yeah. That's why the Stratton School has two gyms. <laughs> and then it, it, then it come up, and that's what the, when they built the freshman building at the high school to house only the ninth grade. It's called the freshman building. And then we had to use that building again on the renovation of the Odyssey when we put not only the eighth grade in the, in, in the high school, we put the seventh and eighth grade in the high school for almost two years. Yeah. So it, 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 we have this history of. Hopefully, we can we could we can make the adjustments without getting too drastic on that. Now, Jonathan, did you have Yeah, I'm just wondering <coughs> what kind of deliverable we can expect coming out of the task force. Is, is the goal to come up with a, uh, a plan and a capital budget to do some temporary expansion just at the Thompson, because that's an immediate need, or is the goal to try and come up with a comprehensive expansion plan to be voted on at I mean, the, the, I think the goal is both a short term and a long term. I, I think simply because of the time frame, uh, and this is just my guess, is that the best we'll be able to do is come up with a, uh, a short term fix, whether that's busing or whether it's demountables or whether it's uh, using the art room or whatever, uh, and then maybe start thinking about long term. Um, maybe some planning money or something like that. Charlie? Yeah, I, I think one variable that we don't understand yet is the fact that uh, this year's student class is lower by about 106 students than was forecast in the projections only last spring. And the question, I mean, the, the uh, uh, dem demography study uh, report forecasts that there will be uh, 369 additional students in the elementary school system by uh, 2020. And having a 100 student 
shortfall now in that uh, forecast, um, you know, can, can really affect where it goes downstream. In other words, is that a blip? Uh, if all of those <coughs> students are in a low grade, they just project their way through. If the shortfall is all in the fifth grade, they're, you know, it's not going to change the uh, uh, change, change the outcome five years hence that, by that much. And, and then the, the other the question is what actually caused the shortfall from the forecast and is it repetitive? Because if it's repetitive, that also changes the outlook. And I think you know, we have to try to understand that before we start committing millions and millions of dollars to a solution that um, you know, is going to have a, a big impact on the town. As, as a couple people mentioned on the task force, the town is facing a lot of needs, including uh, the renovation of the high school, the renovation of Minuteman, and a possible override in a few years, as you saw with the long-term plan. And uh, uh, you know the resources of our citizens are not endless, uh, so you you know you got to make priority decisions in this. So uh, you don't want to rush into a permanent expensive fix. On the other hand, you got to take care of the kids that are there. So that's the challenge, Jane. So what I would say is, as <coughs> you know, both go to the task force meeting and then work on the subcommittee that reviews the school budget, is um, it, it's, it's an incredibly frustrating experience to go to these meetings. And, and it's frustrating in a couple of reasons. Is you know you have this really critical problem. You have this really critical problem at the Thompson that needs to be dealt with now. You have this critical problem at the Hardy that's a year coming, and then you've got all these other issues. Um, but on the other hand, and I'm gonna, you know, this isn't the first time I've said this, I think I say this every year, you have a school department that just can't get the numbers right. Okay, and the reason I say that, and I'll just go right through it. They go to the task force and they talk about the Audison growing by like 100 kids or 200 kids over the next two years, right? In order to get that, they're assuming for the first time in the history of Arlington, no kids are going to private school. Private school is going to stop being an option in Arlington. No attrition. So you look at the numbers and you say, guys, that's not the number. Now, I'm not, the number is not zero growth, but it's not the, the 200 kids or whatever they keep projecting, right? Um, and then we hear a lot about um, that there's a crisis in all of the schools. So there's a crisis in every elementary school. No, there's not. If you take the McKibben report, which I did, and you move it out to 2019-20, and you try to figure out how many classrooms we, we need, there is not a crisis in every school. There is, like Al said, there is a, an urgent, urgent, urgent crisis in East Arlington. And then there's some other things you can manage, right? And then we get into the peripheral nonsense. And what I call the nonsense is I hear all over and over and over again about the problems with the gym at the Thompson School. The gym doesn't work. The gym, you know, we're doubling up 65th graders in a row. But this is sort of the, the third wave of smoke and mirrors, right? And let me just try to explain it. Assume you go to a certain specialist, art, library, things that once a week. So you can take five sections a day, 25 sections a week. So you can fit, so if you have one classroom, you've got 20, you have 20 classrooms in a building, 25 sections, they can all go to art in that one room. The reason it doesn't work is for, for PE is you have to take PE twice a week. So if you have a building with 20 kids, they have to take 40 sections of PE in one gym. So, you know, 46 to be 25 on the chart. So you've got to double some up, right? You've got to double up some rooms and things like that. I think about when we all went to school, right? You divide the gym down the middle, you've got one class on one side, you've got another class on another side. So the way it would really have to work at the Thompson right now is, it, you know, it's like 15 classes would be alone. With one class at the old gym and then like 13 would have to double up, okay? So they chose to double up the 60 kids in the fifth grade, which inflicts maximum pain on a population, on a parents that are in classroom size of 30 and really aggravates. Like, it's really, like, I, I understand their pain and their sympathy in doing that. But that's not, a, and so it's translated back into a space issue. It's not a space issue. It's an, it's an allocation. They could have put, you know, the lower grades as a doubling up. Or maybe it's a teacher issue. Maybe we don't have enough PE teachers to cover it. But I think that's sort of going back into the pile and creating more of this mess like we've got this like and it's it, it sort of when you when you put all these together it creates what feels like an unsolvable issue that can only be solved if we throw a ton of money at it um 
And, and so I think where, where, where the answer probably lies in a degree of, you know, you can't manage your way out of this problem. You really don't need to spend your way out of it. There needs to be a combination. We might have to manage some things better. We might have to spend some things better. Um, that, that's sort of, I think, where, where the challenge is in all of this. And I think it's a lot of the things we've talked about year after year when we review the budget with the school committee, but that's kind of where we're, we're stuck, right? And then the last thing um, I, I would point to is even on like the, the how much they need for additional growth factor. I think, you know, the, the school department came up with this interesting chart where they multiplied this and they divided this and they, they did all sorts of fancy stuff, right? But if you just take this chart and do what I did, right, you assume this grade leaves and this grade shows up, I can tell you how many teachers you need for your year without using an algorithm or a factor or a formula or any of that. And so we create all this chaos that I think makes it very difficult. And so that's sort of my takeaway from the process so far is we, we sort of, instead of just sort of nutting it down and saying this is what we really need and this is what we can manage and this is what we need more money for and this is how we just, process is just sort of, it's gone crazy early on. So I think that makes it very difficult when people are frustrated to get to an answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any other comments or uh, questions? Alan? I'd just like to spin exactly off what Dean was just saying. It is, in many ways, a, a chaotic situation in the mathematical sense, in that there's a lot of uncertainty. There are unpredictable feedback loops of, you know, as the schools get better, fewer people go off the Belmont Hill, and as they get worse, more people go off the Belmont Hill, things like that. Uh, it's hard to predict the demographics. To a great extent, the private sector has uh, um, you know, absorbed the idea of variability and uncertainty and done things as simple as you know, modular offices and whatever that are intended to be flexible. You don't build you know, marble monuments anymore. You build flexible things that move around. And I think approaching it in a situation like that, which goes back to you know, good use of modules and flexibility and dividers and whatever, plan for that uncertainty. Don't build schools that we have to sell off 20 years from now, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe, uh, the flexible solution with investment. Okay, so those are the, uh, well, the, there is one other issue too. And uh, Adam and I were sort of going through the Gibbs, seeing about space and things like that. And you had these nervous people following us. <laughs> so. <laughs> like that one? <laughs> It, it, it's, um, it, you know, we, we, we need to, uh, we need to settle it, you know, for that, for the, for the Gibbs too, for the tenants. Uh, you know, they, they have contracts with us, they've been paying us money, uh, they provide a lot of good services for the town, and uh, I think that's got to be taken care of one way or the other fairly soon. Uh, we have to do it by June 30th, but I don't think we should wait that long. Okay, is there any other? Dick? Has anybody looked at the uh, uh, elementary school that St. James had up there? That's, is that that's, 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 no, that, that, that's uh, a preschool. I can't yeah. think of the name. Yeah. Probably got a social school. Right. They, they moved from uh, where they were on uh, Lowell Street over to the, the, the. They moved a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. right, after, right after the Greek church purchased that right. property, they kind of. <coughs> Yeah, that's but is that, that school being used? Oh, it's oh yeah, it's full. Oh, it's a school. Uh, Arlington Heights Heights Nursery School. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of kids in this town. Gosh knows where they came from. But. And we have all those um, the after school kids in the Gibbs, and that's giving us revenue. And we would lose a few class. Yeah. Okay. Is there any uh, is there any further discussion? Any other questions? So what I'll do is uh, the minute I get the updates from Dan, I'll email those to you. Uh, we just got updates on the McKinnon report. Um, I just got them late this afternoon. I'll, uh, I'll email those to you uh, probably as soon as I get home. Um, please save the 13th and the 20th for finance committee meetings uh, so that uh, we'll have plenty of time to actually vote and discuss these. And as soon as capital budget and the manager's office get, you know, solid things on their parts, we'll shoot those right out to you. Okay, there's no further discussion. Oh, Charlie. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to note that uh, one, of our, one of our members has resigned, and um, I thought we ought to give him a... 
sense of our appreciation for his work. Think about Lynn. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, Lynn, after, after spending how many years with us? Two? Two. Two years is, is off to greater things <laughs> on that. So, uh, Lynn, thank you for your good work. We appreciate it. That's instead of a raise. <laughs> okay, meeting adjourned. Thank you.